Oh man, I was hoping you wouldn't tell the, the clue to everybody. Anyways, that's okay. So better be, and the case is better to be lucky than good. So this is actually a case that um, I did um, right before I left LA. A 15 year old who has a history of a critical AS had to repair and then had a ROS with a nine millimeter homograph and later it was upsized to an 18 millimeter pulmonary homograph. Um, he actually was relatively asymptomatic, uh, and at the time when they did the MRI, noticed that the, uh, the function actually was pretty good, and there was not much um, regurgitation, and you can see there's a little bit of discrepancy in the, in the flows, but overall pretty good. Uh, there was a conduit a stenosis on the echo that measured 55 millimeter uh, gradient and good function. And so we, it was referred to us for the cath, and we brought the kid to the cath, and you notice that here, the numbers actually aren't that impressed, right? The RV was 47 over seven, MPA 24, so there was about a 20-something millimeter gradient there. Not terrible. Um, the RPA uh, was 19, and so there's a stenosis to the right and an LPA of 25, and output was actually fairly normal. So here's a picture. You can clearly see that in spite of the gradient, that's not too bad, that there is a stenosis in this region of the homograph. I'm going to move a little faster. So you, again, you see that it's a pretty tight stenosis there. Uh, and also, there's a very tight gradient uh, a, a stenosis in the RPA. Again, this demonstrates that you can have a very tight stenosis, even though the gradient's not too bad. And the reason is because there's just more pre preferential flow to the other side. See how much bigger the LPA is. So again, don't use gradient as the only criteria for doing something. Uh, angiographically, you'll see this. And if you did a flow scan, you'll notice a big discrepancy. So the conduit actually measure only 11 millimeters, and this is a 15-year-old big boy, so we know that it's too small. Um, the distal conduit measured about 16.8, which is close to the 18, but proximally it was only 13. There was a severe osteostenosis. So we went ahead and made all the measurements, and so the question is, what would you do? You can say, let's not do anything because the gradient's not so bad. The pressure is only 55% uh, percent systemic in the right ventricle. Only a 23 millimeter gradient across the conduit. An RV was only a five millimeter gradient. Again, I don't always use hemodynamics to make decisions. And geographically, you also have to make decisions based on that. Um, so we decided to intervene. The question is, how, how do you proceed? Is it RPA angioplasty and then stent first, or do you go right to the melody valve? Uh, so these are the kinds of decisions you have to make in the cath lab, the dis and you also have to make decisions about diameter. So first, we just ballooned the RPA uh, with the Atlas uh, balloon, and then we brought it back to the conduit and bl ballooned it some more to just make sure that it's okay. Uh, that you seem like it go up pretty easily. Uh, there was some calcium along the edge. You notice that there's not much of a, um, a improvement in the RPA there, and so what would you do next? Um, basically, we decided to further dilate it, and so we start with a 16. So here we're going up, and I don't know if you notice a problem in, the, in this case already. Uh, of course, we notice it only afterwards. Um, I'll point it out afterwards to you. If you notice it, let me know. Uh, I don't only have seven minutes, so I can't even show it very easy. So here we are, after we balloon it, you notice that there is a dissection, right? Right in this spot. Now we know, remember I said last yesterday, that if you see a dissection, you have to decide, is this contained or not contained? And at that moment, we actually thought it was contained. So hemodynamic is stable, what do you do next, right? Do you stop or do you say, let's put a cover stent or proceed with an RPA stent first and then with a melody valve? So we proceeded with the RPA stent, and you notice that there's still some uh, di dissection that's uh, there, again, but the contrast sits there, so we said, okay, this is still contained, let's take care of it. Um, here's the problem, what's going on here? If you have a dissection, the last thing you want to do is put a catheter into that dissection, right? Because you make it worse. Of course, in this view, you couldn't, I couldn't tell, but the lateral view is not what you want it to be. So again, it's important to look at things in a biplane, not just single plane. Uh, but here we are pushing it in the catheter in there, making it worse. But we know there's a lot of scar tissue there. So I said, okay, let's save, let's get this out of there, and let's keep going. So we proceeded with the stent, and actually was, went pretty smoothly. And this is what it looks like. Again, it looks pretty good now. Uh, there's much, much better flow there and more evened out flow. But again, you still see a little bit of uh, dissection there, right there. And we have to say, is this still contained? Yes, it's still contained. And what do you do at this point? Well, at this point, we said, let's just proceed and see whether uh, we should, um, uh, we took another picture, but you notice anything different now? 
it looks like that that area is no longer, remember earlier, the contrast stuck there, right? But now you notice the contrast disappears as if it's going somewhere else. Then you start to worry that if the contrast doesn't sit in one spot, where is it going? It's got to be going somewhere. But you see this contrast here before it just sort of sat there, but now it just goes away. So you start to worry a little bit more because that's how you decide whether something is contained or not contained. Um, so at this point, he's stable. He said, let's keep going. Um, uh, so we went ahead and did a coronary shot to look at the coronary to make sure that it was fine. Um, now, the reality is that we should have done this before the, the, the dilation because, again, if, you're have a, if we found that the coronary was near this area, now we, we'd be in trouble, right? So that's why the mistake was not doing this before the actual intervention, even if it was the RPA. Um, so we end up saying, let's go ahead and put a covered stent in first, just so that we can protect that area. So we put it in. We had a lot of trouble pushing this stent past because it keeps getting caught on the edge of the dissection. And this is one of the problems in that outflow track is that even though you have a dissection there, even if it's contained, um, these edges are very stiff and you can't, you can actually make it worse by pushing the edge. So here we're having some trouble there. No, notice that even here, as we push on it, the sheath is kinking, right? So now it makes it even harder, but you actually can create this, you can make it worse. So uh, you, now you start to see a little more than that. You have a dissection here and you have a dissection here. And I think it's actually was there before. We just didn't recognize it. And so we're making this worse as we're trying to get the stent into position. So it's eventually we decided, let's just put it up first. Maybe we are able to capture this um, part of the dissection here, and maybe this was the tip will be okay. Now, I wasn't sure at the time. I was looking at here, and I thought, okay, this area looks like it's right over where the stent is. So we went ahead and put the covered stent in. It's a, it's a covered stent on a 14 millimeter balloon. Um, not even the larger ones, using the smaller ones. And we thought, okay, now we got ourselves in trouble, but now look at this. So probably we got rid of this uh, uh, dissection here, but look at this. This contrast is now going further and it's sort of disappearing. I start to worry at this point, so I'm telling the nurses, okay, let's hurry up, let's get a second, uh, 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 let's get the melody valve in, because the melody valve has some um, uh, covering to it. And I noticed, I don't think people will, were as worried because they don't recognize what, what they're seeing here. You notice this contrast is getting bigger and it's sort of disappearing. But so far, the hemodynamics were great. And uh, uh, Frank, what is the size of this uh, stand? This is, uh, it was on a 14 balloon. So we, we actually did it with a 16 and then we with the 18. I said, at this point in time, I just want to get something there to cover it first. It, it was measured like 12 something. So we said, are we going to put a second valve I'm, in? I'm glad I didn't know this was going on. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm glad you didn't too. So, here, so we actually end up, a, we're able to get the melody valve into position. And you notice that now I want to use the covering of the melody valve to go further in. But again, you still have the ostium of the R RPA. Um, again, I use the stent here to help me at least mark the edge of the stent. So we actually were able to get that past the uh, area of the stent and then we went ahead. Very difficult advantage. In fact, you notice instead of going direct, we had to actually make a loop this way to get this um, up into position. Again, this is to point out that sometimes the direct pathway may not work. You have to make a loop to get in. And this is on a 22 French system. So here we are getting a couple of repositioning, trying to make it work, and then we expand. And at least at this point, I feel like we're in the position. We do this, and it looks really good, and we get rid of it. And now you notice there's not, uh, there are no more residual um, um, tears that, or dissections that we notice. So I felt very good at this point. Hemodynamics still very good. Um, and here's the post-angiogram. So you can, I can probably convince you that the tear is now protected, right? So I said, okay, now uh, we're in good position. Actually, now we can make it bigger. So we went and you, remember, this is still a 14. Went to 16, and then uh, eventually to 18. So this is an 18 millimeter, and uh, there's good forward flow. There's no more stenosis like before. And at this point, we took the, everything out, and we, I always uh, filmed the, uh, the melody valve to, to get a baseline to make sure it's circular, and that in the future, if it fractures, at least I can see what the comparison is. So at this point, I said, okay, we dodged the bullet, let's go home. Um, so luckily, before we pulled the sheaths, um, he became hypotensive. So of course, what do you do? You floor the chest. And now notice all this time, everything is magnified. You're focusing on the area that you're working on. 
This is the second mistake because at the time when we did that dissection, we didn't pay attention to the egg bigger lung fields, and we should have. We were focusing so much on that spot that we didn't back up and say, let's look at the big picture. Well, this is what it looks like. Oh. Clearly, you can see that it must have bled. It became uncontained. We knew that might happen, but as long as the, the, um, the pressures were fine, we were just going to try to close that, uh, that dissection. So this is what he, he bled into the chest. Um, he got some volume, uh, got some epi, and his blood pressure actually improved. Then we put a chest tube in, and we got rid of the blood. I think we took out a liter of blood, and his vital signs remained normal, and we sent him back to the ICU. Basically, we knew that the bleeding had stopped at this point. All we had to do was really get rid of the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the blood that was in the pleural space. And so, really, the takeaway lessons for this case is that even if you don't see calcifications, dissections can still be a, a, a problem, and you have to pay attention to it. Um, don't take any dissections for granted, but you do have to ask yourself, is this contained or uncontained? Um, you probably need to look at these dissections in different angles to make sure you understand what is the anatomy of that dissection. And again, you have to be aware that there may be more than one dissection. So you focus on one, you, you don't look at other things. So pay attention, there may be one area. Uh, you constantly should be reevaluating. I thought I was doing that, but I think the key thing was that I did not uh, unmagnify to look at the chest uh, film beforehand. <laughs> Um, and again, once you see a dissection, pay a lot of attention to your catheter so that you don't actually end up making it worse by pushing it in, in there like I did. It could be wires, it could be catheters, it could be, it could be the stent edge that you're pushing on. So be very careful. The mistake there was that I should have put the long sheath way past this dissection, put it into position, and then pull the sheath back, but I didn't do that. Um, zoom out to look at your lung fields. So always have your cover stent available to, to back you up. That was my plan B. Uh, the other mistake was to not perform the autograms in the coronary before even starting the intervention. I think that's important. So that was my uh, um, lesson to myself. Okay, I'm going to go to the second case. Um, can you? Yes. Okay, and that's the, the case of the flyaway stent. And uh, someone who had asked me to see if I can come up with a, uh, a, a case to look at how do you retrieve and reposition. So this is actually a case that one of my colleagues did uh, when I was at Davis. And you can see that the angiogram shows us a, a fontan with a severe LPA stenosis. And I just put the arrows there to show you the length of the stenosis. And granted, again, the gradient was very low, but you can tell that this is severe. And so he put a stent in. Now, I wasn't involved with it at the time. Um, actually, this was an eight millimeter stent, uh, a balloon on eight millimeter stent. So you see the positioning of it. Obviously, he's trying to get this to the edge of the glen to try to span the entire length of this. And uh, I don't, you can probably start to notice a problem already. At this point, the stent has been implanted and the balloon uh, was pulled back. But do you notice any problems there already? I'll just play it some more. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, you can probably tell that the stent has shifted more distally, yeah. right? Yeah. And in fact, the stent is probably undersized because the distal vessel is bigger. So again, it's really important to make sure you make the measurements to pick the right size balloon to use the stent. And so therefore, there's not a lot in, the, the vessel itself is not holding that stent very carefully. And so in fact, it, there's a cone shape to it and the stent is slowly milked its way out forward. And so I think that the balloon size was not uh, the right size. So again, it's really important that, again, I always say this is not over until it's over and you gotta get everything out and you notice this is a problem here. So what do you do at this point? Options are go back with the wire and then try to use a bigger balloon. However, um, then that's when he called me to take a look. I said, you have an option to try to go back here but you also have a risk of it um, embolizing it further. So maybe leave it in position, let the endothelize and come back and further dilate it, knowing that you still have to deal with this part of the stenosis that, that's unstented. Um, so that was the plan. Um, so those are the options. Add another stent, leave it alone, come back, and you can decide what you want to do. But again, if you are doing this case, you have to make these decisions. Well, the decision was to leave it alone, and the kid went to the ER and went home actually, went to see him in clinic the next day, and you know what happened, right? So here we are, we're back in the cath lab. The x-ray was done, so I didn't have that, but you can see that stent had milked itself out into the distal LPA. 
So this, I got involved at this point. So you can see clearly how much bigger the LPA was compared to the stent. So again, I think the key thing is here, you gotta measure your accurately so that the stent is the size of the distal vessel. You don't wanna be smaller than the distal vessel. But where it is, is in the lower lobe and it's stuck there um, in, among the very small, a few small branches. Um, now, I, I actually took a picture here to see where the edge of the stenosis is here. And you can see that it's actually the proximal RPA that is the, now the LPA, depending on where the, you know, where it's coming off the glen, but it's pretty tight there. And then you have to decide, what am I gonna do at this point? Well, the first option is to try to, re I said yesterday in the, uh, the lecture on the complications, the first option is try to retrieve it and put it back into its original position. If you cannot do it, then, then you leave it in the safe place. It doesn't do any good, it doesn't do any harm. And if you can't do that, if it's not safe, then you have to retrieve it. So the thought was that um, maybe we can actually get it back into first, in a good position first. But now, remember, this stent is already dilated. How do you do this? So you have to have a strategy going in. So we so took some pictures to get a feel for where the edges of the gland is. You can see that uh, we have to put a stent, the stent should be sitting from here here, all the way up to the edge of the gland, right? Uh, this is now angulated to get this, uh, the profile better. So the first thing is to just see if we can rewire it. So we have a long catheter as an angle glide, and we're able to put the wire back down through the stent, luckily through the top and not through the side. The second step is to try to get the wire as deep as you can in the vessel that you need. I just showed the measurements here, just so that we have a feeling for what the sizes are. Um, so here you're talking about a proximal being 9.6, and the length of this is about 21 to 22 millimeters. Here you see the stent is about seven millimeters. It was on an eight millimeter balloon, but it was seven millimeters. And then so once we get the wire in, again, you have to show that the catheter, the wire is as deep, you put your, uh, uh, the floppy glide catheter in. Again, try to get it as deep as possible again. But you notice that angiograms show that there are not too many vessels out there. So once you get there, you take a picture to get a feel for where you need to put that wire. And that's important because if you don't do that, you might actually perforate down to a small vessel. So you have to know the anatomy. It's always important to know the adjacent anatomy to wherever you're going. So once we did that, we put the catheter in position. You notice that we put it into uh, the, a vessel and we can't go any further. But again, I, I, I take this picture because I want to tell myself the wire cannot be advanced any further than this. So then we went ahead and put the, the, the wire in. Here's the Rosen wire getting into position. It's got a little bit of a loop to protect me from perforating further, causing another hemorrhage like the last one. So the first thing we did was to balloon this stenotic segment first. Now again, most people might say, let's go pull the stent back. But remember, that area is really small. If you wanna try to bring the stent back into that area, you won't be able to get in because that vessel is smaller than the stent. So the first thing to do is just balloon it. So we ballooned this with a 10 millimeter balloon because remember, proximal is 9.6 or something. So we first try to make it bigger so that the vessel can accommodate the larger stent. Um, again, these are things you have to decide and make a decision ahead of time. Once we did that, we took the balloon out, rewrapped it, and okay, we ballooned again. Now I want to show you something. This is really, really important. You have, notice what just happened. Yeah. This is inflating that narrowing area. These are very subtle movements. The stent does come yeah. up. Did you notice that last movement there? I'll go back again. Um, these are the things you have to pay attention to. I suspect that when the stent was first put in, the, the person who did it did way. not do a pretest, did not pre-dilate. For any time that's long segment, I always pre-dilate because I want to make sure that the balloon is stable. If you don't assess that, you put the stent in and the stent slips, with uh, the balloon slips, the stent is gonna slip with it. So that's not a good sign. So you always want to pre-dilate to make sure the balloon is stable. Here's another example. Now, so the first one is slipped slightly far. Look what happened the second time. This is even more obvious. There. So you can imagine the stent there, if it was on the balloon, would slip forward. And that's, I think that's what happened initially. Unfortunately, there was no floral save. So again, I want to make sure people say, keep your floral so you can learn from these mistakes. So you can see that when I did this, I said, that's not good enough. So we actually did it again. We did it several times until we show that the balloon is stable. So at this point in time, I know that we were able to open up the stenosis and the balloon is stable. And that way, when you put the stent in, the stent is going to be stable. Okay, but that's just F to Frank, guess. Oh. Sorry, I have a question for you. Uh, what sort of balloon did you use? Uh, High pressure I, or just? No, just eight normal? millimeter low pressure. Not low pressure, like eight, 10 millimeter uh, atmospheric pressures. So that wasn't a thing. Uh, so now the next thing to do is, and I want to note, I want you to see what we're doing. So we took the balloon out and we prepared the balloon and the same balloon is now being advanced. Do you notice what's on the balloon? 
There's a snare that is preloaded onto the balloon. My purpose is I want to try to snare the stand onto the balloon to try to retrieve it. So you can see how we're able to get the balloon into the stand, but the snare is still here. And so now we can take the, um, oh boy, it's, it's all coming together. It should have been, um, so here you can see the last one. The snare is coming through and let's see if I can get to the next stage. So here's the snare, and once the balloon is in position through the stand, we then open, uh, push the snare out, so then that snare, now the snare is around the, the shaft of the balloon, and then you can see how we're gonna try to bring that snare over the stand on the outside. So it's over the shaft um, of the balloon, but now the, the, the snare is gonna grab the stand from the outside. I'm sorry, this is not showing. But anyway, so you can see what I mean by that. So at this point, we're able to put the snare over it. Now the question is, what size balloon and what size snare? Right? These are decisions that you have to make. We use the same 10 millimeter balloon because I know that I can, that's the size I need to bring it back to where we want. The snare was actually a 10 millimeter gooseneck snare. Most people say, let's get the biggest snare possible. The problem is that if it's a snare is too big, it can't unfold the natural way. So if it's in a small vessel, it gets very convoluted. So you want a snare, you don't want a snare so big. So some, it's counterintuitive. It's better to use a snare that fits that diameter of the vessel. So this is a 10 millimeter gooseneck snare. Remember, this was measuring eight millimeters. So now we're able to snare from the outside and Sorry, I'm not showing everything that I'm supposed to show. But anyway, so now that was it, notice what I just did. Now I snared it down and crimped down the proximal edge. So now you notice that the Very proximal smaller. edge of the stand mm -hmm. is smaller than the distal stand. Why am I doing that? Remember, the balloon is actually still there. Once I grabbed it, I pulled the balloon back into position. Notice that, look at the radial paint markers. So the snare is holding the stand. I'm pulling the balloon back so that the balloon is now traversing the entire part of the stand. And at this point in time, we are, Whoa. oh boy, I'm sorry, I wish I yeah, could show you the, um, the, so once I did that, I inflate the balloon, so now the balloon is holding the stand, the snare is still holding the proximal part of the stand, and now I've created a nice taper between the balloon that's inflated partially and the snare that has been crimped down onto the, the snare. So with that, I'm actually able to, I wanted to show you that we're able to now pull it back into position, back to the, where the stenosis is. And the reason why that's important is because you don't want the stent edge to get caught on anything. So by inflating the balloon with a little bit of a tip of the balloon inflated, you form a nice smooth edge. And the snare crimps that tip of the stitch and down to the, the, uh, the wire, di the balloon diameter. So with that, now we can open up the snare. See what I'm doing? We remove the snare out and now we can inflate. And now you can actually get it back to the 10 millimeter, which is probably what you needed in the first place. So why, after we do that, we take another picture and you see how uh, we're opened that all up. This is where the Glen is coming. That's why this picture is important to know where the edge is. But you notice that this is actually much longer than what he measured originally. So we end up putting a second, um, we went, put the sheath back in, we put a second stent in there. And here's the second stent going in. We balloon it further, just open everything back up. This was supposed to go one at a time. So, um, and this yeah. is what it looks like after. So again, I say, it's not over until it's over, right? We take a deep breath, we think everything is good, but don't think it's over yet. Okay, so then at this point in time, we actually took the wire out, it was fine. I just wanna get you excited. Um, so here's the stent, it looks very good. It, it, it matches the edge of the gland and then it goes all the way into the larger part of this. Uh, so actually we were very happy with this. Um, so now it's really over. So now you can relax. Um, so let me show you what we did. Basically, you take the balloon, you, you run the snare over the shaft, you crimp it down onto the shaft and the entire thing goes through the sheath. And then this is what happened. We actually um, wrapped the snare around the proximal part of the stand, inflated the balloon. So you notice that um, this is a very uh, nice taper. So therefore the edges of the stand don't get caught on ed any part of the stenotic vessel. So here's the take home lessons. You need accurate measurements. You need to use the right size stent and balloon. So this is really important to make these measurements accurate. You should always want to test inflate to make sure the balloon is stable before you stent. As I said, it's not over until it's over. And it's not over even after it's over. And there are techniques to reposition the embolized stents. Thank you.